My guests today are Sean Bannon, the director of the affecting new documentary, The Smell of Money, now in select theaters and on demand, and actress Kate Mara, who serves as the film's executive producer. It tells the story of the residents of eastern North Carolina who are battling the port companies that are polluting the air, ground, and water around their homes with waste from their pig farms. It's the story of a community banding together to fight a century worth of environmental injustice. Sean Bannon and Kate Mara, welcome to Group Text. Thank you so much, Melissa. It's so exciting to have you guys here. And I have not been able to stop thinking about the movie since I saw it. It's truly infuriating. I mean, how did you first learn about big pork and the extreme, I mean, it's ridiculous pollution plaguing the residents of Eastern North Carolina? I mean, I, I can start. I, I've been working on factory farm issues for like two decades now. So it's something I'd heard about. Uh, people, you know, it's been, there's been some short documentaries, about, you know, or big documentaries have little sections of North Carolina in them. So I kind of had an idea, but no one had done a whole documentary, like a feature length documentary on the community. So I felt like I wasn't getting a clear picture. So I didn't really know what was happening there until we went and started filming. It's it's really appalling. Yeah, it's beyond it's beyond appalling, and and knowing that like it, there's things that could be changed pretty easily to stop it, but it's just it's just one of those issues that there's always something more pressing in the news. There's something more urgent when you you know when people are dying slowly, and it, it goes unnoticed, and that's you know it's it's really it's really sad. Yeah, to me when I. Because well, when I first watched this documentary a few years ago, when Sean sent it to me before I was involved, it felt like, I mean, I was as shocked as as you are, Melissa. I, it felt like um, like this horrible secret, you know, that that only certain people know about. And uh, I felt so blind by the whole thing. And I was so ashamed that I, I didn't know that this was happening to our neighbors and to um, to so many people. Um, and so to, for me, that's why it's so important to get this this movie out there because I just feel like there are so many of us that are completely unaware of it. And it it really does, um, it makes you want to do something. Um, and I just think it's so important for us to know what's going on in other places. If it's not happening right here in your neighborhood, it is happening very, very, very close by. So how did you get the movie to start with who connected you to Sean well Sean reached out to me um we've known each other for a little while because of um animal rights stuff that we've done together um one of our other uh co-producers Michelle Cho who's one of my best friends um she she actually um introduced me and Sean years ago um and he sent it to me because I, I and Sean you can you can correct me if I'm wrong but at the time I remember he was just sort of showing it to friends to I think hear opinions and um get some feedback and um so there was I I didn't feel like there was you know there was any sort of um uh, it wasn't like, will you be involved in this? It was purely, this is what I made and what do you think? And I personally just could not, it was so, it still is so incredibly haunting to me. And I, when I was watching it, I had one of my kid, my eldest kid was there with me and he had his headphones on watching. Um, he was watching something on, on a computer and I was watching this and he could not stop taking his headphones off to hear what was happening. And, you know, he was asking some big questions about it. And I just felt so, um, I felt this immense responsibility to, cause I didn't have so many of the answers. And, um, and so I fe felt a real responsibility to know more and to do more, especially for my kids. I mean, now there's three of them, but at the time it was two of them. And um, yeah, I, I couldn't stop thinking about it. And so I reached out to Sean afterwards and said, you know, how incredible I thought it was. And if there was any way I could be involved and help this story get out there that, you know, I wanted, I wanted to. Sean, what got you involved in this particular story? Cause it's quite specific. Right. I mean, well, I know about this issue, but our other producer, Jamie Berger um, is from North Carolina and she did her thesis in, in college, you know, about the impacts of factory farming. So 
she she had so much research already um but we really didn't know if people would talk to us like when we decided you know we, we piloted a bunch of ideas for making a documentary because we had made a few shorts together that were, that were pretty successful and um we didn't know if community members would speak to us or be open to that and we really wanted to be careful like we knew that people were living in really horrific conditions and had very serious you know there was very serious threats against people's lives and, and their livelihood and their jobs so we just took our time we're patient you know went and connected with people and people were open right away it was surprising like some people were open and then some people you know it took a year two years for them to get really comfortable with us really gaining trust was challenging because everyone's like what are you doing like what are you doing here what are your intentions and we couldn't really promise that we were going to get to where we're at now <laughs> like we didn't promise anybody that we just had to hope and like say hey look this is what we can offer and we're going to do our best to like get your story out there explain to people what these people are going through and why like a cliff notes version yeah i'll give you the short version i'll, I'll tell you about renee and elsie i mean they both lived on their family land um their entire lives their families both you know got these plots of land after slavery so their families have been living on 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 this land for over 100 years and these huge factory farms have moved in like renee for example has 26 factory farms within a few miles where she lives and the hog waste what they do is they store in these huge lagoons and then they spray it to get rid of the waste and so the spray field's right across from Renee's house. It's right next door to Elsie's house. So they're spraying hog waste on their clothes. It gets in their well water. So they have nitrate pollution, so they can't grow their own food anymore. Um, it's inside their house. So now, you know, the decades, you know, there's now studies that really just came out by the time we were finishing the documentary that were, were very smart uh, studies because they go all over the country and are looking at the impacts of like nitrate pollution, air pollution, and, and even places like Bakersfield, which has a lot of factory farms. So they're able to match that and come and come up with the statistics of how many people are you know dying prematurely from these pollutants. And it's it's staggering. The number was like over 17,000 people a year. It's reminding me of two things, just as hearing you talk about it, Roger and me and Aaron Brockovich. That's yeah, right. everyone says the Aaron <laughs> Brockovich connection. Yeah, because... It, it's a it's the issue affects all of us oh yeah it's everybody and it and you know it's about when human beings are robbed of the most fundamental human rights right and it and so how can it not affect all of us um uh, you know the rights that we all deserve and you know the fact that we have to fight for them is wild you know um it's just so it, it's so infuriating um, and I hope that when, if if you watch, you know, if other people watch this, that they are infuriated by it, oh. you know, it, because that's how change starts. It's very much a David and Goliath story with Big Pork abusing what is truly a disenfranchised community in certain counties in North Carolina. I mean, people got sick, like you said, their land values. I mean, pig excrement was literally raining down on them and into their homes. Why? Did the pork producers completely ignore this problem? I mean, it's it, it. I mean, it went beyond uh, what's the saying? Um, willful ignorance. Yeah, I mean, I don't know how specific it with names like Wendell Murphy, who pretty much invented factory farming for hogs, is from North Carolina, and he did end up moving it to Iowa as well. So Iowa is like the number one pork producing state. But the difference between Iowa. North Carolina is residents don't live as close to the factory farms in Iowa, but the pollution is still horrific there. And in and, and, and North Carolina, he was also, you know, Wendell Murphy was also a state senator. So he was able to pass laws to protect the industry. And they just had rapid growth. So it's like any business, it's like they're just trying to get as profitable and expand it. And it takes a while to realize, oh, maybe we made a mistake. And by that time, it's like, it's kind of too late, you know, for, for people who have a lot of money invested. So that's where the problem kind of started is it's just like people, you know, you know, Elsie and her, her family started complaining right away, but other people might have taken, you know, a, a decade or two to get the confidence or get realize what was happening to them. Did anyone try and stop you from making the documentary? <laughs> <laughs> 
Oh yeah. Did anyone not try and stop you? <laughs> I'm, I'm glad I got a laugh on this topic. So everybody did. I mean, everybody did in in different ways. It's kind of like it was really hard for people to believe. Like even our some of our first test screenings, like which was before Kate saw, like we just had like some very rough things people just had a hard time believing it was real like this was really happening so we had to work really hard on getting the you know focusing on the human story here but you know funders we we couldn't really get funding for it until after we had a good edit of the movie because people just didn't think it was you know oh you have to focus on this or that or they wanted to focus on the lawyer story you know we wanted to focus on the community voices and their stories and not make it about like you know this supposedly heroic lawyer that comes in and saves the day. Cause that's not, not what happens there. It's really this community that bands together has been fighting this issue and they're going to continue to fight it until things change. You brought, how did you fund it? So we did it through IDA, the International Documentary Association. And that's what was really cool. So people have sponsored the movie. So it's just kind of like a nonprofit movie to some degree where it's like, everything's by, you know, we've had environmental groups. One of our biggest sponsors is a, is a human rights group and then animal rights groups. So we have been successful in kind of joining all of these uh, groups together, which is really cool. And people talk about being a, a afraid for their lives. I mean, Kate and I face a lot of scary situations just living in L.A. in general. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so... <laughs> <laughs> but people actually talked about being scared. Were there threats? Yeah, and it's and, it, and it's always not just the direct threat. Like for example, like Renee, Renee, almost all of the the farms around her are owned by law enforcement. So who do you complain to if someone's spraying hog waste? You know, you you have to go speak to the law enforcement, I I would guess, but then they own the farm. So there's that kind of threat. But then they also like if she's vocal or if she's outside filming, they come and film her. They have security cameras on their sprayers. So they're watching her house. So there's an intimidation in that way as well. So there's direct. Then there's kind of the more indirect where you just know that the industry has all this power. And also a lot of people in the community are reliant on the industry for jobs. So it's like. You, you do just, you know, a lot of people just stay silent most of the time because it's like, you can't, you can't not make a living. So in some of these communities, it's like, you know, if you work at the school, for example, which we have a subject that works at the school system in the cafeteria, you know, the industry sponsors the schools. So if you are vocal about it, you might have the whole community against you because they're like, they're buying the football uniforms for our team. And some of our young subjects, they told us that they're very conflicted because they might have hog waste being sprayed on their house, but like, the hog industry bought their their football uniforms. So it's like they're they're in a very tough spot when, when you're a youth growing up in these areas because you, you're getting conflicting things happening to you at the same time. That is, that's a very interesting point you bring up with conflicting messages. And it makes me think about the fact that it would have been so easy for the big pork industry to fix these problems. I mean, the, the numbers being floated about settlements 50 million 94 million half a billion dollars wouldn't it have been better to fix the problem than suddenly be embroiled in all this and honestly tearing a community apart like you said the young people and a lot of people are feeling very conflicted true true i mean i would think that's that's a very very difficult place to be in and how, how are, especially the younger generation, how are they processing this and coping with this? Because that's I mean, a, a really of, fascinating point you brought up. Yeah, I mean, well, first I'll just get back to like, yeah, they could put, um, you know, they could clean the wastewater like they do human waste, like there's water treatment plants. Like There are solutions, is, like there are solutions. Yeah, Sean, are solutions. Know, yeah which, is, which makes it even more infuriating because there are things that they could do today that they're just not going to do or they, they don't want to do. Yeah. And then and then for the youth, it's like you could live next to, you know, now things are kind of changing in North Carolina, but all the hog farms were covered by pine trees or some kind of trees like they they would hide them with intent. And finally, it became a law where they had to mark where they were at. So you might have the impacts, you might feel the impacts and not know where they're coming from, which we've talked to a lot of residents about that, like, whoa, like I'm having 
asthma, I have a lot of respiratory, you know, illnesses, it might take them a decade to realize, oh, that's, you know, coming from a factory farm. So for like the youth, they're, they're still, they're still get, you know, getting those impacts and they're not aware that, and that's one cool thing about the documentary is like, we've screened it now all, all over parts of North Carolina and it has been able to bring people together. Like, oh, that's what's been happening to me. These are people that might live like a, less than a mile, but they're still, you know, a mile away and they don't realize that they're still getting impacted because really five, up five, sometimes even 10 miles, but really within the five mile range, you, you could have severe impacts. Now, once things get into the water, it's all a water, very, it's, all place, yeah. it's, it's a very slippery slope, but there are some good guys. Uh, water keepers came in and has been trying to help. Um, a man who used to tobacco farm owns one of these CAFOs, Concentrated Animal Feeding Operations. And you also, which is fascinating, introduce us to a man named Don Webb, who took the right path and abandoned his hog farm when he realized it was contaminating the land around him. Why, what do you think changed these people's mind? Why did they suddenly get involved? You want me to go, Kate? Or? Well, yeah, I, I, yeah, I do want you to go because you know, you, you, yeah, I know them all. Know I just people, don't. But I, I, I will just say that, yeah, Don, Don Webb's story, like those kinds of stories, are so incredibly moving to me because it, it takes real, it just takes real conviction and bravery, I think, to, to, to change your entire life and to go. I mean, it, it should be what we all do when, we, when we realize something is wrong and that it is something that we are. Um, very involved with is is hurting our neighbors. Um, may, might not be hurting you directly, but if it's if it's causing harm to somebody else, like you, that should be the obvious thing to do. But it's it's not for a lot of people. And so Don Webb's story, I feel like is um, is a, a moving one. But but Sean, you, it, I was gonna say it's it's a fascinating one because it is a story about doing the right thing. Yeah. And in the midst of all this horror, here is someone doing the right thing. Right. Honestly, yeah. And Don Webb's just a great example. And Tom Butler, who is still, you know, a hog farmer, but going up against the industry and saying, hey, look, this does impact my neighbors. Like, I do know that. Like, I've talked to my neighbors. I know it. Not denying the truth. And there are these really cool, I mean, that was a really nice thing about filming in North Carolina. People that are these kind of classic, um, you know, really want to all about the truth, like telling the truth, no matter what. So, you know, the one problem, you know, a lot of the farmers are not, you know, the villains here in the story. It's really this multinational, these multi-billion dollar corporations because they're, they're actually contracting these farmers. So it's not the farmer's decision to do this, you know, in most cases. So the problem, the reason most of them won't speak up is because they're in debt. So they get kind of tricked like, oh, you're going to make a lot of money. You're going to do good. So uh, but they don't. They end up, you know, Tom Butler, who's been with the hog industry for, you know, over two decades, he's still in, in massive debt. So, but yeah, Don Webb, you know, w w had enough money where he could get out of the hog industry. So that, that also did help him, like where he was like, I can't do this. I found out it was, you know, contaminating my, my, my neighbors and I care about them. So some people are able to do that. And then financially, I do feel for the ones that want to do that, but they, they just can't. I mean, sadly, he passed away during the the, the shooting. Um, a lot of your subjects are older, and it almost feels like they talk about the pork companies waiting for them to kind of die off. Mm -hmm. and, that, and that brings us back to what you were saying about the younger generation. Do you, I don't want to say there's a master plan, but is it a waiting game? Because the companies can outweigh the people. I mean, that benefits the corporations. Like this is just like a write-off to them. Like the expenses for doing the lawsuits are just part of business. You know what I mean? So the longer these lawsuits go on for them, like this one went nine years, they can last that, you know, these huge co corporations. The amount of money they're spending is is almost nothing to them. So, but the communities, it's their life. It's everything to them. So it makes, you know, not everyone wants to get involved in a lawsuit against a multi-billion dollar corporation because it takes a huge toll on your on your health, on, on your, you know, place. On your community. whole life. It takes your whole a life, everything. You know, just being a filmmaker and having to, you know, we thought we were coming in at the end of the lawsuit. You know, uh, it's now we're almost six years later, of course. So it's like <laughs> from when we started shooting. So you you start to get a sense of of what that's like for the community just to wait and wait and wait and to know like 
you're working on this lawsuit, but then you also have to work on changing the issue too. So that, it, it's interesting to see like there's a it's one strategy of many strategies that the community is using to, to improve their lives. And if that wasn't enough, just when things couldn't get worse, the area had flooding from Hurricane Florence, COVID. But what's interesting is you connect food manufacturing in the U.S., these sort of devastating events, you draw a line to China. What, what caused you to look at that? I mean, we, we didn't get too in depth with that. It's just the fact that Smithfield sold to China. Like it was just the thing that happened during this process. So it was kind of eye opening that, you know, China decided to buy Smithfield. And uh, for them at the time, I don't know if it still is, it was like cheaper to produce pork or, you know, more resourceful to produce pork in North Carolina and North Carolina than in China. So it's just interesting that that happened. But yeah. It, it's challenging for the people in the community to realize that they're getting impacted for exported products. Yeah, it is challenging. Kate, you have really thrown your name and your voice, as has your whole family, behind this. Yeah. Have Have you been sending out, did you start sending out screeners to your friends and your family? And it feels very grassroots, but it feels like you're kind of the engine behind that. Well, I mean, Sean's been working on this for so long and it's really, really hard for any documentary to be seen these days specifically, unless they're a really specific kind of documentary. Um, and uh, there, are, there are so many of them that are out there that either can't get a distributor or um, just people don't know about. And so with this, we thought, and we still, we are still doing this, is that just sharing it with everybody you know and then hopefully they they share it with other people that they know etc cetera, etc cetera, etc cetera. and um you know the the documentary is is so moving so it's 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 not hard to show it to people and then get the reaction that you know ignites the fire in them that's already in us um but yeah my my sister and and uh, my sister Rooney and and Joaquin watched it a while ago and um they've been incredibly supportive a lot of my other friends who are in the industry um, who have a voice have also been incredibly supportive, not just now when we're trying to get it out there, but also in the early days when Sean was showing it to friends and family and, you know, just wanting feedback on what was working and what maybe needed more clarity. So many incredible people um, really stood, stood by us and um, took the time to watch it and give their incredible feedback. Um, David Oyelowo is one that I always remember when we showed it to him, Sean, I felt like his, you know, his notes and his thoughtfulness were so, um, I think important to, uh, to 100%. us. And, yeah. And it, we're so grateful for that. Was yes. it surprising to you how many people actually took the time to well, watch, I only, give I notes? I always said it to people that I knew, I knew, um, <laughs> Would who I knew wouldn't just go. Yeah, I'll get to it. Um, so a very tight control group. Yeah. yeah, but it was crucial. I mean, it was crucial in the movement of the movie. Like when David Oyelowo watched it, like I pretty much, you know, was well. I don't want to spoil the movie, but it was at, at a very tragic time in the movie pro making process, and I just couldn't go on. Like couldn't keep editing. So getting his notes, he was so in tune with what we were trying to do. And it got us back on track. So it's like all of Kate's help and resources. And now uh, it's been almost four years since I sent you that edit, just so you know. So it's oh, my long. God. We're, like, it's not like Kate's just been on this for a year. It's been a very long time. So it's like, I've had, we've, okay, I've we're made still another, promoting maybe, this. You've made another kid. We, yeah, yeah we like she, like you're like the first person to meet my son. He was like two days old. Like we went and met about this movie. <laughs> like he was two exactly. days old. Pretty wild. So it's like we've been working on this and collaborating on this for a very long time. So it's been a lot of effort, a lot of, you know, just putting yourself out there. I'm very, very grateful, Kate. So thank you. Um, you know what? Some mega corporations do get it right. Why is it so hard for them? I feel like, and especially this drove this point home, it feels like most of them only exploit com communities they know don't have the resources to fight back. I mean, it's hard to say if that's the intent or not, but it's 
I mean, the one thing I know about some of these big corporations is they look for loopholes. They look for areas that are like more affordable or have like a certain amount of workers at them. So uh, working with a lot of social justice activists in North Carolina, you kind of get like, you know, the, in, you know, the indigenous communities are often targeted. Then it's like, you know, the historic like black communities were targeted. And now it's like the immigrant communities are targeted. Like they're always looking for places where they can get, you know, the most inexpensive workers. And they and it happens to be in often very poor communities where they can do this. So they might say they don't have the intent, but it doesn't matter if they have the intent. Honestly, that's the thing is it's still happening. How did you know? Because you worked on it for so long. How did you know when it was time to yell cut? <laughs> We're done. I mean, after the stuff with after the lawsuit was over, that's when we thought we were done. Like, that's when we thought the story was going to be over. So we're like, okay, we went to film with everybody and uh, and just get their stories. And that's kind of when, you know, that tw a twist happened in the story. And it was just like totally, you know, that's that's when we're like, okay, we have to keep going. We have to keep filming. We have to, to finish this. So that was very challenging. So, yeah. Okay. Other than eating more salads, how can we help? <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, I, 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 we say that as a joke, obviously, but the, the simplest thing to do, and there are so many things we can do, but really the most simple thing you can do just today, just do it today. If it's too overwhelming to do it every day, you, you choose one day. It really is not supporting factory farming and, and what we buy to put in our bodies directly supports or does not support factory farming. Um, I, I always find that to be the most simple thing to do because we all go to the grocery store or we order Postmates or we, every day we have to eat to survive. And that is, that is the, the, the very first most simple thing we can all do because we have control over what we put in our bodies, over what we put in our children's bodies. And, um, and, you know, it's 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 the simplest thing to do right now. But of course, if, you know, if someone doesn't want to become a vegan or a vegetarian, then there's a hundred other things we could do. Um, Sean, do you want to jump in there? And and yeah, uh, yeah. The one, the one thing like working in North Carolina that really opened my eyes is like looking locally, like what's happening in Los Angeles. We have a lot of environmental justice communities in Los Angeles where certain communities are more heavily impacted than others. Looking there, getting involved with those groups has also been really cool and positive for me. I, I'm really doing a lot of mental health stuff too, because if you do get very serious and want to change the system, like you do need that kind of support and you do need to address that. Because I've been vegan for 27 years now. I've been working on environmental issues that entire time. And this movie really did take a toll on me. Like I was just like, whoa. So the support of our team, the people who have been on, you know, Trayvon, DeRay, Michelle, it's like having all these really cool people, Jamie and Jen, uh, with us the entire time, you know, it's 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 something that you don't always realize you need to stop and pay attention to what's happened to you too, and like prepare yourself for that. So that's something I've been working on. The other real simple thing, and that kind of the first thing that's taken away from these communities is their ability to grow their own food. So this is kind of a cool, powerful thing is like right now we kind of have tried to make everyone dependent on corporate food in the United States. So like go, going to local food, getting, you know, lo local farmers markets is really cool. You know, I have a garden in my backyard now, so it's like growing your own food can be really, really cool. So I like that just to make me a little happier. <laughs> Well, it is amazing. The smell of money now in select theaters and on demand. Kate Mara, Sean Bannon, thank you for educating us. Thank you. Thank you so us. much for having us. Thank you. Media Production.